Welcome to Ring of Fire. I'm Farron Cousins and for Mike Papantonio this week. Coming up on today's show, we'll be talking with Ian Milheiser from Think Progress about a recent Supreme Court case that could deal a very serious blow to the power of American labor unions. The war on women is still being fought by the Republican Party, and we'll be talking with author Nancy Cohen about why this is still a losing strategy for the Republicans. And the Tea Party is destroying the GOP from the inside out, and we'll tell you why big money Republican donors are scared to death about what that will mean for their chances in the 2014 midterms. We have all that and more coming up, but right now, you've just stepped into the ring of fire. You can't change Washington from the inside. You can only change it from the outside. Grand jury secrecy rules. For political gain. The press can find out. It has nothing to do with politics, but go ahead. It wouldn't bother me. Oops. <laughs> This past week, the U.S. Supreme Court heard arguments on a case that could deal a serious blow to the power of America's labor unions and, by extension, the entire working class. The Roberts Court has a very poor record when it comes to workers' rights, and I have Ian Milheiser with me now to talk about the new case. Ian is a senior constitutional policy analyst at the Center for American Progress Action Fund and the editor of Think Progress Justice. Ian, thanks for being with us today. It's good to be here. Thank you so much. So I want to go ahead and uh, before we get into the new case, let's let's look at some of the history of this Roberts courts with workers rights. You know, what have they done in the last few years that that has really dealt a serious blow to workers? Yeah, really, no one has fared worse in front of the Roberts court than ordinary working people have. Um, there's a rule, for example, that if your boss sexually harasses you, it's generally much easier to sue your company for sexual harassment than if it's just a coworker. So the Supreme Court just a few months ago redefined what it means to be a boss so that almost no one counts as your boss. There are, there are people at my office who are senior vice presidents who don't count as supervisors under the Supreme Court's new rule. They've made it easier for, the, for um, your boss to get away with retaliating against you if you file a civil rights complaint. They've um, been enthusiastic supporters of something called forced arbitration, where your, comp- where your employer says to you, look, we don't want you to sue us in a real court, so if you want to keep working for us, you have to agree only to sue us in this fake privatized court, where, by the way, we're going to pick who the arbitrator is. Yeah, and you, um, you, and usually then, in those cases, they come from uh, you know the, the corporate uh, defense law firms, and it's they're good friends. These guys, they've gone up against many, many times in the past, and more often than not, it's either going to reduce the amount that uh, the consumer would get or completely go in favor of the corporation. But uh, sorry, go ahead, continue. Yeah, no, I mean, this forced arbitration, it's, it's a huge mess. Um, there was a scandal a while back, and fortunately this company has largely been shut down, but there was a company that the credit card industry used to do that was basically a rubber stamp arbitration company, where the credit, the credit card company would go to this, co- this arbitration company say, hey, we want to collect money from someone. And then the arbitration company would give them an order saying, oh, yeah, you can collect all the money you want. And then that order was enforceable in court. So this forced arbitration thing, it's something that's a big problem across the board, but it's a huge problem for workers. Because obviously if workers can't enforce their legal rights in a real court in front of a real judge, those rights don't mean much of anything at all. And so right now, uh, earlier this week, Tuesday, the, the Harris v. Quinn case was argued. I, explain that case to us. You know, what's at stake here in Harris v. Quinn? Sure. So this could be a huge blow mostly to public sector unions. Um, the way that collective bargaining works, when, when unions bargain um, for workers' wages and workers' benefits, they're not allowed to do two things. The first thing they're not allowed to do is they're not allowed to require non-union members to pay for their political activity. So if they want to um, go out and endorse Barack Obama, endorse whoever, only their members can be charged. They can't force non-members to to pay that. And then the second thing is that they're not allowed to bargain only on behalf of their members. So if you're a non-union member, but you work in a unionized shop, you get the higher wages, you get the increased benefits that the union bargains for, even if you don't join the union. And those benefits can be significant. In a unionized shop, the average worker earns about 12% more than in a non-unionized shop. So that's what the unions have to do. In return for that, 
the non-members who work in that shop can be required to pay what are called agency fees. And what agency fees are is bargaining can be expensive. You need sophisticated negotiators, often you need lawyers, and that costs money for the union. So if the union's going to get me a 12% pay raise, and I don't want to join the union, I don't have to join the union, but what I do have to do is compensate them for the negotiating costs, compensate them for what they spent to get me that 12% pay raise. And what the Supreme Court looks fairly likely to do, although there was one surprise in the case, um, is say that at least in public sector unions, that arrangement doesn't exist anymore. So the unions will have to bargain, bargain in front of everyone or bargain on behalf of everyone. But if you want to be a free rider and you want to get your raise and not, get, and not compensate the union for getting that raise for you, fine. That's the risk that we're, that we're running in this Supreme Court case. So what are the odds, you know, uh, Roberts very rarely has surprised people, but, but he has a few times. I mean, yeah, we, he can obviously count on the the loyalty of Scalia, uh, uh, Alito, and Roberts, but uh, or, or not Roberts, excuse me, um, <laughs> Thomas. But uh, do do you think Roberts is is poised to kind of uh, rule against unions in this, or do do you think we might see one of those very rare sparks of you know uh, compassion towards humanity and, and true you know justice within him? Well, that 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 brings me to the surprise. I mean, I wouldn't expect Roberts to swing here. You know, Roberts is generally very loyal to whatever the U.S. Chamber of Commerce wants. Um, but Scalia, of all people, Justice Scalia, um, seemed hesitant at the oral argument about adopting the anti-union theory here. You know, he he's written in the past that well, wait, these agency fees—they're just about preventing free riders. I don't like free riders. Why 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 is there a problem here? Um, so Scalia is the potential swing vote here. Really? Now, that all said, I'll believe Scalia is going to swing when I see it. He has right. swung before. He swung in an important Arizona balloting case. He swung in an important case dealing with um, banks and whether banks are immune to fair lending laws at the state level. Um, but he's a very, very conservative justice, and he's teased us before. And in one of the recent very damaging um, forced arbitration cases, I thought we were going to win it. I thought we were going to win it based on Scalia's questions. And then we got a five to four decision that was a train wreck. So I'll believe that we'll get Scalia's vote when we get Scalia's vote. But he swung before on rare occasion, and there were some indications that oral argument he could swing again. And uh, Alito, I know he had hinted in the past as well that he wanted to go after these agency fees. Is that correct? That's correct. And this is what makes me most nervous. There was a case called Knox in 2012 where Alito wrote an opinion, and he wrote an opinion on behalf of all five of the conservative justices, including Scalia, where he said, I think that these agency fees are a problem. He thinks it's a First Amendment violation, which is weird. I, I mean, I don't see how if you are paying money to someone so that they can get you even more money, that that's really a, an issue of free speech. That's, that's just a financial transaction. But Alito seemed to think that because this is a public sector union that deals with government and that has some sort of public policy content, I think it's a silly theory. Um, but it's a silly theory that five justices signed, in, signed on to an opinion saying they seem to agree with. Hopefully Scalia has changed his mind. So what what's going to be the the overall effect? Suppose you know the the conservative court here does what what we kind of expect them to do almost, which is to take away these agency fees. What will that do to to the power of collective bargaining? Um, I mean, it could have a serious impact. You know, again, we're probably only talking about public sector unions here, so government workers. Although God knows what the Supreme Court does in the next case once a company says, "Well, we don't want our private sector workers to have union rights either." Um, but still, the, the risk here is a death spiral. The risk is that if a union is able to collect these agency fees, they're going to have less money coming in to pay for negotiation. They're going to have to make up that shortfall somehow. And the way that they make up that shortfall is by charging their members more. Well, if they've got to charge their members more, there's going to be members who say, well, you know, I can't afford these fees anymore. I'm going to drop out of membership in the union, which means that the union's going to have even less money coming in, and they're going to have to jack up their fees even more. 
And that's the death spiral. It's, you know, you take away money that the union needs, so they have to start charging people more for the service that they're already providing. So some people decide to stop paying those fees, and it spirals and it spirals and it spirals until all of a sudden the union can't function anymore. That's the danger. Um, if the Supreme Court goes the wrong way in this case. You know, for, for many years now, there, there's there been this banner. Uh, the Supreme Court has carried it very well, and they've done a very— uh, not the Supreme Court, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, excuse me. They've carried it very well, and they, they've executed a lot of plans. It's the whole defund the left. And it was uh, uh, the two primary targets for Democratic Party funding have been the labor unions and the trial lawyers. Uh, do you see this possibly as an extension of that, basically taking this fight— to the court system rather than, you know, uh, through politics or, or policy. I mean, is, is that an extension? It's interesting that you bring up the chamber because the chamber very much views the Supreme Court as a vehicle that it uses, possibly as the primary vehicle that it uses, in order to implement a pro-corporate agenda that often isn't very favorable to workers or necessarily even to anyone else. Um, they have a very sophisticated attorney, Rachel Brand, who leads that office, who leads the litigation shop. She was a fairly senior Justice Department attorney under George W. Bush. She's got a bunch of people working for her. And the chamber, I used to be able to say that the chamber was the winningest um, amicus litigant, meaning people who file these amicus briefs that just advise the court on what they think the court should do, it was the winningest amicus litigant in the country. They have a very, very high win rate. Um, in front of Alito, it's close to 100 percent. Right. Um, actually, there's one other organization, though, that now has a higher win rate. And that's the Cato Institute, okay. which is a very, very radical libertarian shop, a shop that has said in the past that they think that Medicare is unconstitutional, a shop that has suggested in the past that we should go back to the early 20th century where union busting was protected by the Constitution. Um, and so you have a Supreme Court that is very keen to hear from forces that aren't attuned to workers. Um, that are often hostile to workers and are certainly hostile to a vision of the Constitution that will allow us to govern ourselves in many cases. And, you know, bringing up the Cato Institute, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, both of these groups, a lot of these conservative groups have huge money donors behind them. I mean, they, they've got the billionaires. They, they represent the corporations. Uh, people typically don't look beneath the surface, but that's all these are. These are corporate front groups that go out there and they fight on behalf of the corporations, not the workers. How, how can these unions who, who obviously do not have billionaire backing, how, how do they fight this massive influx of almost unlimited money? No, it, it's certainly true that there's a David and Goliath problem here. You, you know, I, I ran the numbers a while back. They've probably changed, but a while back, the AFL-CIO's total assets, if they sold their building, if they completely liquidated everything that they owned, the national AFL-CIO had about $86 million. And that sounds like a lot of money. But Exxon, which is just one corporation, makes billions of dollars each quarter. And so when you look at how lopsided this fight is, you know, it's very frightening. Now... That said, the reason why the chamber is doing so well, the reason why Cato is doing so well in front of the Supreme Court, isn't because David Koch is giving Cato a lot of money. It's because there's five Republicans on the Supreme Court and there's only four Democrats. Right. And, 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 and well, they've, they've done a great job over the years of, you know, uh, packing the courts. And that's that is the main area that voters typically don't pay a lot of attention to. They don't realize that, yes, OK, I vote for this Republican He's going to be in office for two years. If I don't like him, I can get rid of him. But while he's there, he has helped confirm a justice that possibly has a lifetime appointment. And, and, and you know, that's that's the overall ramification of our votes is that, you know, this guy might be able to be voted out. But who he's put on this court, he could sit there for 20, uh, 10, 20 or a lifetime. Yeah. No, and that's a fantastic point. I'm actually writing a book now called The Case Against the Supreme Court which lays out the history of how the, all the problems that the Supreme Court has caused in American history, from striking down child labor laws, to allowing segregation, to dismantling Reconstruction, now to what the Roberts Court is, is doing, not just to workers, but to voting rights, 
um, and to anti-discrimination law generally. Um, the Supreme Court has been a force of bad for most of American history. And the reason why is because for much of American history, we haven't had good judges and good justices. And this, I think, is now an issue that if progressives want to have a chance to, do, um, to see their agenda implemented, if they want to have a chance to not have things get rolled back to the way they were in the early 20th century, we have dropped the ball on the judiciary. We have not treated with the same passion that the right has. We certainly haven't done things like George W. Bush did, which is nominate dozens of absolutely brilliant attorneys to the lower court so they could be ready for the Supreme Court someday. And I give Bush credit, you know, these people, Jeff Sutton, Brett Kavanaugh, these lawyers that he appointed are some of the brightest lawyers in the country. They're also very, very conservative. And Barack Obama has not met that force with equal force. That will bite us absolutely if, if, if progressives don't buckle down and take the judiciary seriously absolutely ian thank you so much for uh, telling us the story today thank you corporations have been systematically taking away our rights and most consumers have no idea that this is even happening they're doing this with a legal tool known as arbitration and most americans have signed arbitration clauses without even knowing it Joining me now to explain the arbitration trap is attorney Matthew Edling. Matt, thanks for being with us. You bet. Good to see you again, Farron. You know, uh, I, thinking about this whole arbitration thing, the, the Republican Party has always been on this kick of privatization. We want to privatize our, our roads, our police forces, our schools. And now, through arbitration, they've kind of managed to privatize the legal system. It's taking justice away from you know, perhaps juries or judges and putting it towards this this corporate, usually panel. I, explain a little bit what arbitration means. Sure. Um, arbitration has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. It was around in England uh, before America even existed. It, point of fact, George Washington in his will had an arbitration clause, um, but it didn't really gain any real traction in the everyday lives of Americans or businesses until the early 20th century, uh, right around 1925 when the Federal Arbitration Act was enacted. And it was designed such that businesses who would be, you know, think of them as peers, right? You have a large corporation against a large corporation. They have a business dispute that they would prefer to resolve maybe in private. They would prefer to resolve it more quickly possibly than a big public trial. That kind of made sense. Um, then what has happened, and it's no surprise to those of us who have sort of lived through the uh, political morass of the last 30 years, the Chamber of Commerce got a hold um, of the power of arbitration. And then it began uh, putting in arbitration clauses into everyday contracts that consumers those who would not be on a peer-to-peer -peer level, such as two businesses would, uh, into their contracts. So if you buy a car, a computer, a telephone, uh, a cell phone, any, any contract that you can imagine, uh, now um, has an arbitration clause. And what that does, uh, in, in pretty simple terms, is it takes away your right to adjudicate your claims in a court of law, whether by a jury or a neutral finder of fact, and puts you into a forum where there's either going to be anywhere from one to three arbitrators who are, uh, generally speaking, going to be members of <laughs> the industry that you're suing, uh, if it's perhaps a financial product that you're suing over, or could be lawyers or just day-to-day -day business persons, but whom would probably come into contact with the very company or industry that you're suing regularly as they are a member of a uh, panel of arbitrators. So you, you don't have a judge, you don't have a jury, uh, it's going to be done in secret, and it's going to be costly. So, you know, it, as you pointed out, kind of in the early days, this, this was sold, you know, good, good idea in theory. Don't, don't sit there and wait for, you know, a trial that could take, you know, a, a year to even get to. We can go, we can meet with people, uh, you know, that, that, that we pick or that you pick or however. You know, we'll, we'll hash this out. You'll get your settlement. It'll be quick, easy, painless, done. But when corporations got a hold of this 
and started putting it everywhere, they've decided to stack these arbitration panels with these people, and they still they're still selling it under the idea that the consumer is going to save uh, both time and, more importantly, money. But but the money issue is not necessarily any different than it would be if it went to trial. Is that correct? Yeah, I'll even argue that in many instances now it's more expensive, and I'll give you a very simple reason why. Let's assume you sign a contract, virtually any contract, um, and your contract will be governed uh, under the Federal Arbitration Act, which is what most contracts are governed under, and it provides that the forum for your dispute, meaning unlike the court uh, who is going to hear your matter, is the American Arbitration uh, Association. Now, the American Arbitration Association generally will put forth arbitrators who are lawyers. Now, these lawyers are paid on an hourly basis, unlike a judge, right, where you don't have to pay for that judge to hear uh, your dispute other than obviously he's paid through the tax dollars of the citizens of your state. Arbitrators, on the other hand, are paid their market rates. Oftentimes, these contracts will require uh, that your issue be adjudicated in an urban area, such as San Francisco, Chicago, New York, Dallas, Houston. Note that I'm identifying major metropolises, but also happen to be the most expensive places in the country. So these lawyers, their market rates can be astronomical. So for example, I have a case now where I represent 20 to 30 elderly investors. They won a trial. Uh, there was a dispute with the insurer where the insurer didn't want to pay, and that contract required arbitration in New York. My clients, who don't have the money, are being asked to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars just to hear their matter, right, which is we want a trial, we want the insurers to pay, to be heard by New York lawyers. These New York lawyers are simply saying this is what our market rate is, and this is what we expect that this matter will cost to everyone. Now, to me, that sounds like just a complete deprivation of justice and is not a fundamental precept of what this country was founded upon, which is the idea that in a civilized society, disputes should be handled not out in the streets, but in a civil arena where everyone, theoretically, is on a level playing field. Right. Of course, and that's not the case. <laughs> it never is. And, and so you, you made a great point. We, we're already paying for judges. Our tax dollars are paying for this. So we have already paid for a legal system. Now, obviously, if you want to go out and hire an attorney, you're only going to want to pay for that, that, that attorney. You're not going to want right. to have to pay for an additional panel of, you know, three, three attorneys who are each charging an hourly rate of, you know, between four, five, six hundred dollars. And all of a sudden you're on the hook for that as well. Now, as far as the, the rulings that typically come out of these arbitration panels, is, is, there, is there a mix? I mean, is it, you know, half consumer, half corporate, or, or is it skewed one way or the other? You know, not, not surprisingly, obviously, where you're dealing in an industry where there's repeat business. And I'm not impugning any particular arbitrator. These are just statistics. Um, the consumer is losing anywhere from, depending upon what study you're reading, 50 to 95 percent of the time. Um, a better example, uh, at least from my experience, is I represent a lot of um, investors and elderly investors who, for one reason or another, have um, had a dispute with a bank or a broker dealer or their investment advisor. And there's always an arbitration clause that requires that matter to be arbitrated within FINRA, which is the successor to the uh, NASD. And so, you know, and th this is not. A lot of times it really doesn't even matter how great your attorney is. I, you know, you're a fantastic attorney, absolutely fantastic law firm. And, but if, you're, if the deck is stacked against you, a lot of times there's really not much that, that can be done. If you have three corporate lawyers who are going to decide between you and the corporation that they basically work for, yeah. there's very little you can say to change their minds. Yeah, here I'll give you a, a concrete example. On a case that I just arbitrated in FINRA, uh, the panel that was available to me must include, so there's a panel of three, must include one industry person, meaning literally from the exact industry I'm suing, there must be one of that industry. So you're going to have a financial advisor evaluating whether another financial advisor erred. Now, I 
will suggest that there are some fine, there are some individuals who are just going to apply the facts as they see it. There are others who realize they know where their bread is buttered. And this is a situation where, at least in my experience, um, and I have had some, some very big successes uh, in this arena, but oftentimes you're going to find that even if you win the case, um, there will, the arbitrators can find a way to reduce your damages such that your win doesn't feel quite as wholesome. Uh, is, and it's an unfortunate reality of, of where we are. Well, is, there, is there any sort of a, a federal review on these, these judgments that come out of arbitration, or is it, you know, what the, what the panel says sure. is what sticks? Um, there, is a, there is an appellate right. It is incredibly limited. You're going to have to prove that one of those panel members literally might have made a mathematical error uh, or committed fraud. Uh, and it's very hard, obviously, to, to convince a panel that they committed fraud. So the appellate right for any arbitration decision are virtually nil. And that's partly by design because originally, way back when, when we were talking about this in the early 20th century, this was supposed to be a speedy and efficient way for businesses to resolve disputes. And it has morphed into this, you know, I call it a black market justice, right? You don't get to see what goes on and you just know that it's not going to go good for you. Um, and, you know, the results are what the results are. You know, consumers lose more often than they win and they're losing a lot more often than they should. And is there, uh, real quick before we go, is there anything consumers can do to protect themselves before this happens? Yeah, I mean, there, there's, some, there's some ways. You know, there's the obvious where, look, if you want some change, this is a legislative issue, um, and you're going to have to really get after your legislators. And I think this is one of those issues that um, individuals don't ever think about. It's not a big, sexy political issue until you're in it, and then you realize conservatives and liberals alike, that you want a neutral finder of fact. You just want a straight deal. And when you're not getting a straight deal, you're going to be pissed off. And there are very limited ways to do it. You could try to strike the clause from your contract, but that's really not going to work. Um, you're going to potentially argue in court that the arbitration clause in of itself is unconscionable. That's probably not going to work because the Supreme Court's pretty tough on that one. So I think what you're left with is, one, make sure you get a really great lawyer, a lawyer who knows how to arbitrate cases. Two, that you understand that your rights are being deprived, in some sense, by taking away a constitutional right to a trial by jury. You know, and a trial by jury, this is a fundamental precept of this country that people have long since forgot. It's one of the reasons that King George wasn't working too well for this country. And I think lastly, uh, and, and you know, maybe most importantly, is when you find that lawyer, you make sure that he or she understands that this is obviously a very important matter to you and that they are protecting your interests as best as possible. Matthew, thank you so much for being with us today. All right, thank you. The Republican Party is suffering from a very severe identity crisis. The internal struggle between the old guard and the Tea Party has reached a fevered pitch, and that's leaving their funders in a tough position. Joining me now to talk about this is attorney Howard Nations. Howard, thanks for joining us again. Hello, Farron. This, uh, this is quite a fascinating battle, uh, internecine struggle within the Republican Party. It's uh, the battle for the GOP soul. It's going to be very interesting to watch over the next few months. Well, so, it, you know, right now we basically, we've got, we've got this little faction that, that's called the Tea Party. You know, they, they came out, you know, very late 2008, early 2009, completely funded by groups like the Koch brothers. And so right now, basically, the fight is kind of between the, the Tea Party and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, right? 
Right. The Chamber of Commerce is, uh, and the establishment Republicans are very fearful of losing the House of Representatives this year, which is a real possibility. But they're also fearful of not gaining the Senate. There are six Democrats running for re-election in states where Romney carried those states in the last election. They would normally be thought to be pretty vulnerable, but they're getting a lot of help from the kamikaze wing of the Republican Party. So the Chamber of Commerce is financing primaries against the evangelicals. So Karl Rove played a, a very big role in mobilizing these evangelicals in the 2000 election, 2004 election, uh, uh, certainly. So now he has created this monster that can't be stopped, and he is, is having to go out there and try to fight back against them. Yes, Karl Rove is very concerned, and he should be because this is the monster he created, as you said. He's now formed American Crossroads, and his president, Stephen Law, says that there's a broad-based concern about having blown a significant number of races because the wrong candidates were selected. So you got Rove versus the evangelical theocrats. Uh, it, it's a fight over a base that consists of neo-Confederates, uh, white supremacists, know-nothing libertarians, and, you know, they're nothing if not noisy. Uh, they can, but they can also raise funds. They can't be underestimated because that group is very useful to numerous billionaires, such as the Koch brothers. Uh, the Koch brothers back that far-right agenda not because they believe in any principles that may exist there, but because it supports their business agenda. But if you look aside from the Koch brothers, the Politico uh, said that in 2011, 2012, there are 25 social conservative groups raised in excess of $280 million. So they have the ability to raise funds. They've got uh, uh, <laughs> very big money there. And so the Christian right, they, they themselves have a bit of a problem because anybody in the past who wanted to, to latch onto that, they could, they could wear the banner of the Christian right, but still when it came down to getting work done, they would be able to compromise with Democrats if they needed to. But that's not the case today, is it? No, it's not. Uh, the Family Research Council, Council President, Tony Perkins, who's the darling of the Christian right, says that we have to dump moderates to save religious liberty. And their biggest target is the House of Representatives. Uh, you know, this whole business about the religious right and social conservatives, they're totally obsessed with controlling everything related to sex, religion, and race. And they're religious extremists, and they can't help themselves. If they could compromise, they wouldn't be extremists. So by definition, religious extremists can't compromise. But they're so preoccupied with religion and race, sex, militarism, guns, and their other demagogic exaggerations that meaningful communication with anyone outside of their own little bubble is a virtual impossibility. And I think the best example of what's happening right now where this is playing itself out is in uh, Kentucky with Mitch McConnell. The Tea Party has come out. They, they, they've put up their own candidate, haven't they? They have. Uh, the, J, uh, the Madison Project, uh, which is headed by Drew Ryan, uh, says that the Tea Party is now professionalizing their approach to politics, and we're getting a game plan, and their opening shot is at Mitch McConnell. Uh, be before we talk about their candidate, let's look at the man they think is too moderate. Mitch McConnell uh, is a strong believer corporations are people. Uh, he's in favor of un unlimited corporate campaign money. He defends oil subsidies. He defends job outsourcing. He's the absolute math mouthpiece for corporate America. He was in favor of cutting $40 billion in aid to needy families. And he wasted four years as a minority leader of the Senate attacking Obama. And he lost that battle. And he was the leader of the uh, Republicans in the Senate in the worst Congress in history. So he's a perfect conservative for Rove, but the uh, right wing says he's out of touch because he's a Washington conservative and he doesn't fit their agenda. So they're running a gentleman by the name of Matt Bevin, uh, and Freedom Works is backing him. They say he's more fiscally sound. 
and also they are opposed to McConnell because he helps fund Obamacare. And McConnell opposed Cruz's plan to shut down the government if they voted on anything to support Obamacare. And the Cruz government shutdown was ended by McConnell making a deal with Harry Reid. So their real reason for supporting Bevin, he's not Mitch McConnell. <laughs> That's it, it's very sad to take a, a a little character like Mitch McConnell, you know, who who who, as you pointed out, he is he he hates unions, he hates trial lawyers, he hates anybody who funds Democrats, he hates making compromises. He he favored the government shutdown. He ended it because he under, he's not an idiot. He understands that it's hurting the country, it's hurting the economy, uh, but still. He's not conservative enough, and that's where these groups, Freedom Works, you know, uh, the Koch brothers, the all these other massive right-wing think tanks, that's where they are wanting to take the country. Yes, absolutely. I like. I did like McConnell's response to Freedom Works, though. He says Freedom Works has gone from being conservative reformers to conservative cannibals. <laughs> <laughs> Feeding, that's, that's certainly what we're <laughs> seeing within the party. It's, it it has become cannibalistic. If if you're not as you know, further to the right than the guy next to you, then that guy next to you becomes a moderate, and a moderate, unfortunately for them, is a target. And that's we need some Republican moderates in there. We cannot continue to have this, you know, uh, Michelle Bachman types trying to call the shots because they don't get it. They're unfortunately they're they they're not smart enough to understand that you have to put politics aside and actually attempt to run a country from time to time. Well, don't underestimate McConnell, though, because he's heavily funded by corporate America uh, and by the Chamber of Commerce. He's been the uh, longtime lapdog of the Chamber of Commerce, and he also has the National Republican apparatus behind him. What's going to be much more interesting is the race that he's going to have in the fall with Allison Grimes. Uh, she says that uh, Bevin is a self-funded billionaire who took taxpayer bailouts for uninsured for his uninsured businesses, and he falsely claims to have attended MIT. So she started the attack on Bevin already, just in case. But you've other got it's not just Madison Fund; it's you've also and, and Freedom Works. You've also got the Senate Conservative Fund backing Bevin, and they are. They've spent $2 million already in Senate races, and they have four races against incumbent Republicans that they're backing. So it's, this, this cannibalism is spreading. It's, it, it, it's quite a freak show that's going to play itself out this year. <laughs> it is indeed. You know, the, don't forget the religious right. American Principles in Action says that suppressing Christian, the Christian right will likely consign the GOP to permanent minority status, which is actually a pretty good place for them. <laughs> but, but they say that they can rally people on the social issues and bring in Hispanics and, as Romney would say, binders full of women. <laughs> so basically we're looking at a battle for the heart and soul of the base uh, with the future of the GOP hanging in the balance. And, and they're trying to achieve that by targeting some of the highest profile Republicans. For example, Lindsey Graham, who's always been aligned with, with McCain, uh, and he has been targeted by the kamikaze wing of the Republican Party, and they're backing a state senator. And this becomes a pattern, this idea of, of getting state senators to run against United States senators. They're backing a state senator named Lee Bright, who says FEMA is a scam. And he favors abolishing the IRS because they're Obama's brown shirts for enforcement of Obamacare. So there's yet another rational mind out of the right. Well, I, uh, I think it's going to be very interesting when the, the GOP has to find out that running a guy for a, a, a state house is a lot different than running somebody for a federal office where you have national attention paid. The, the sum total at the moment is that there are 12 Republican Senate incumbents and seven of those 12 are being primaried by the far right wing. And 25 House seats, which is enough to switch the control back to the Democrats, are also being targeted by the right wing. So the freak show continues, and the Democrats are delighted. <laughs> Howard, thank you very much. My pleasure, Farron.
The GOP's war on women helped cost them the 2012 election. And while the National Party is hoping to reverse their anti-female image before this year's midterms, a large portion of the party can't stop their misogyny from spewing out of their mouths. Joining me to discuss the party's problems is Nancy Cohen, author of the book Delirium, The Politics of Sex in America. Nancy, thanks for being with us today. Sorry, great to be here with you today. So I'm going to uh, <laughs> I've got to start with Mike Huckabee. This he is the complete embodiment of what is wrong with the Republicans view towards women. Uh, t- t- tell us a little about Huckabee. Well, yes, I think Huckabee shows that the Republican Party has been taken over by a small group of zealots who are obsessed with sex and specifically women having sex. So what Huckabee did uh, at the Republican National Meeting um, uh, last week, the week before, was go on this weird rant about women's libidos and Uncle Sugar. Uh, Coded language for Obama, of course. We won't even get into that part of it. Uh, and what he, he, what he got wrong in that is biology, science, economics, women, that the list goes on. So the underlying thing, though, I'm sure most of the people watching Ring of Fire know that, what Huckabee said. And what underlying it is this view of women that is fundamentalist and traditional and believes that women sh- are, should be submissive to their husbands. And the interesting thing is that Huckabee prefaced this statement with, well, women are, we are a party that supports women's equality and advance. And those are just empty words for them because they really don't see women as deserving equal opportunity, equal leadership in our society. And I think as you started out pointing out, American voters see this and they don't want to put in power a party that doesn't believe in gender equity anymore. It's simple as that. Right. And and, uh, you you pointed out uh, uh, Steve Pierce from New Mexico, Republican, uh, was one of the ones who said that, you know, the wife's job is to voluntarily submit to husband. And I, I, I know... It, it, it's funny to repeat these things that they say. It, it, it's humorous that he said Uncle Sugar, but it really does, you know, there is a serious problem here. You know, these are national speakers. These guys have influence. Some of them are in a position to, to, to make and pass laws. And, and this is what they honestly believe. You know, th- this is a, a part of the party's platform. And that's why the last I saw, I think it was about 63% of women across the country have an unfavorable view of the Republican Party because of this. I mean, this is a very serious problem, not just for the GOP, but for America. Absolutely, absolutely. And we've seen them pass laws all over the country over the past year uh, on women's uh, reproductive health. Uh, And many of those laws have this underlying assumption that women can't be trusted to make their own decisions about their bodies, about their lives, about their families. You know, some people say, oh, this is just about abortion, but it really isn't. The issue at hand that Huckabee was talking about was birth control. And it really has to do with, you know, are we a free country or are we going to let religious zealots decide that women have a particular place in the universe and they are going to legislate that subordinate place. You know, it seems like these guys would be much happier if they were living in the early 1800s back when you know women couldn't vote, minorities couldn't vote. It was just the men. The men were in charge of everything. Or it, it doesn't even have to be the 1800s. There are plenty of countries around the world run by religions where they can go and enjoy this this little slice of life that they are trying to create in America. But, you know, I, I think it's very telling. Uh, in December, they actually got together, the Republican uh, National Congressional Committee, and said, we have got to start training our people, you know, the, these men who run against women or just men who go out there and speak on behalf of the party, we have to train them on how to speak to women. They are so out of touch that they have decided as a party, they understand they have a problem, and that they're going to have to go out and teach each other how to speak. Right. Well, the problem is they want to teach them how to speak and message and rebrand. 
but you know, you can't lie about what your product is, right? <laughs> and what's interesting that, you know, John Boehner particularly, he's kind of an old fashioned political poll, you know, grease the wheels, hand out lobbyist checks on the floor of Congress, I, I think isn't really too happy about this, though he likes his power. So he wants them to stop talking about what they believe. And personally, I think that Huckabee was, you know, kind of giving the middle finger to Boehner and saying, sorry, this is our party, and I am going to deliberately talk in the most outrageous way about all these issues of women to show you who's really in charge. And it's the sexual fundamentalists who are really in charge of this party. And I don't see it changing this year in the midterm election. And they've got some some pretty serious battles coming up uh, uh, this year where they have, you know, male GOP candidates who are coming up against uh, female Democratic candidates in states like uh, New York, Illinois, Florida. This is going to be an issue for them, whether they want it to or not. And I would say, you know, you combine Steve Pierce, Mike Huckabee and a whole host of others. I mean, if you just pay attention to the news, you'll see these stories pop up once or twice a week. They're already setting themselves up to to lose this war that they have started. I'm really watching Georgia where Michelle Nunn is running. Great candidate, centrist, you know, political dynasty with her, uh, with her father, Sam Nunn. She's running against, remember uh, when the Komen Foundation defunded Planned Parenthood? Well, one of her opponents may be the woman who was the head of Komen at the time who made that decision. Another of the GOP candidates is the guy who said, Evolution and the Big Bang Theory are theories from the pit of hell created by Satan. I mean, there are four or five candidates in that race that are, make Todd Akin look like a centrist. And so there are a number of these races in, um, in real swing states and kind of red states where I do think that the Republicans are going to trip all over themselves and hand Democrats, and particularly Democratic women, the win. And, you know, obviously there, there are women out there who, who do support Republicans. There are Republican women in, the, uh, Republican women in Congress. Do they, has there been, have they come up forward and said anything like, you know what, this, this does not uh, speak to me, or have they just remained silent, I guess, as the men in the GOP would like them to? Well, it's a great point that you bring up because one of the little reported things that happened at the Republican national meeting was a resolution that was passed that said, you know, we've really been too silent about um, outlawing abortion and we really need to stand up for our pro-life candidates and maybe defund candidates who aren't uh, pro-life. And that was introduced by a woman. So what you have, there are Republican women who share these uh, religious beliefs, and it's their honest values that a woman is first and foremost a mother, but she can do a lot of other things besides being a mother. Sarah Sarah Palin is kind of the model of this. As long as you do your duty by becoming a mother, sure, you can become president. You can be a congresswoman. So it's actually a lot of women activists in the Republican Party that are driving some of this kind of retrograde um, ideology about women's place. It's very contradictory, but they're trying to find a way to balance their religious fundamentalism with, frankly, their ambition. Wow. Unbelievable. We, we certainly have a very interesting year ahead of us as if this is how the first month of the year is going to go. <laughs> well, Absolutely. Nancy Cohen, uh, the book is Delirium, The Politics of Sex in America. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Farron. Great to be here. Hoping to ensure that corporate campaign money continues to flow their way during this election season, Republicans in Washington are hoping to deliver a huge gift to corporations this year. I'm joined now by attorney Michael Berg to explain what the Republicans are trying to do to once again make life easier for the top 1%. Michael, how are you today? I'm good, Farron. Glad to be here. Good. Uh, uh, so so this, this big gift that uh, the Republicans are trying to give to corporate America, wh- what is it? Well, it, you know, they're calling it, it's an act that was enacted, the Federal Account Tax Compliance Act, which 
is really making sure the tax cheaters who've been putting their money in Switzerland, the Caymans, other islands around the world are actually going to have to pay their taxes. You know, if you had, if you had, he wants to basically repeal that. Solomon Rue uh, of the RNC, uh, he wants to repeal it, and he wants to repeal it so the tax cheaters can give money to the RNC. I like to call it, if you take all the initials, the fat cat, I'm putting a T on the end, which is the takeaway, uh, to allow these fat cats <laughs> to continue to cheat the government, take money out of our tax coffers, and now give the money that they're able to use from cheating, we know they've been doing it, uh, and give it to the Republican Party. Uh, UBS, we know, was criminally charged for hiding tax cheaters uh, in Switzerland. Uh, as a result of this act, they came forward with the names of the tax cheaters. Uh, we can't let these people cheat the government because what it does is puts a burden on all of us and makes our taxes higher and, and basically allows these people to get away with cheating the American government. It, it makes our taxes higher to the tune of about $300 billion uh, every year. And that's not a, that's just what what it's costing us. It's costing the government in tax revenue about one hundred and fifty billion dollars a year. If you add it all up, that makes about nine percent of the yearly federal budget. So we're we're losing close to ten percent of of funding the government because these corporations, these corporations that these Republicans want to hide, they want to shield, they want to protect, they want their money. Those corporations are costing us that much money. And and it seems like this again is a is a just another continuation of their policies that always seem to benefit the one percent. Is that you know is that how you see it? A absolutely. If you look at what you know, I just saw the movie Wolf of Wall Street, and there's a great scenes in there in which he's taking his money into Switzerland to try to hide it, to keep it. And there, of course, he had you know there were illegal things going on, but that's what's been going on. These billionaires, multi multi millionaires, and putting their money overseas, and they don't want to pay it. And what the Republicans are doing is they want to keep that money coming into them, and then they want to make sure that the un unemployed, the people who are out there working for jobs, the Republicans in Congress won't extend the benefits for, for unemployment. So, again, we want to, they want to protect these people who are cheating the government by, by hiding their money, and yet. They are unwilling to be able to give benefits for people who unfortunately are out of work and are looking for jobs. It's really disgraceful what they're up to. I, I think one of the best points that uh, you, you've made here is the fact that this is not this is not just people trying to shield money. Oh, we don't want to pay taxes. I, uh, with the UBS case, we th there's criminal activity here. You know, th there are illegalities taking place all over, and, and FATCA is one of the only tools we have to uncover that, correct? Absolutely. And, and, what, and what the act does, it, it makes Switzerland and the Caymans and these other places comply with our law and reveal to us those people that are hiding money over there. It's pretty simple. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be allowed to make money and not pay tax on it and hide it someplace. Uh, I can't imagine that the American people, if they understood what was going on, would vote for any Republican that would vote for the repeal of this act. You know, it's it's uh, again, we go back to this continuation. It, it really did start when Bush came in. We had these Bush tax cuts, you know, greatly benefited the wealthy. And at the same time, he's cutting things like the estate tax. You know, we, we can't tax inheritances anymore or certainly not at the levels we were. And we, we keep going back to this policies of the one percent by the one percent for the one percent. You know, how, how do how do we break out of this cycle. I mean, it, I, I don't understand it. It, it. I'll tell you what, it's controlled by Wall Street. Wall Street controls this country, and, and that's where the problem goes. We, we know with Citizens United, it's unlimited funding for, for campaigns, and the, the big rich people at the top, I mean, with regard to the estate tax today, uh, where it used to be you could have tax-free in a state of around 700000 today. It's $5.2 million for an individual and over $10 million for a couple. And yet, you know, we still see the programs and the benefits like food stamps and unemployment benefits. They're being cut. So the richest 
are, are getting all the benefits. And unfortunately, the 99.9% are, are basically going to have to pay that bill and not get the benefits. And what this causes is a decrease in the, in the, in the, in the earning power and the ability of the middle class. For example, there's a big debate now today, Farron, as you know, with regard to raising the minimum wage. Uh, we've had another show that I did, I think, with, with you and, and with uh, Mike Papantonio. McDonald's gets subsidizes. They get subsidizes from the, from the U.S. government. People don't realize that. And then their, their workers can't afford to even, you know, live at, at, at the subsistence level because their wages don't allow them to do that. The, the, the mistake is, is that if you let people earn more money, they're going to put that money back into the system and, and the economy is going to grow. But the richest people don't want to have that happen. So I saw a great study a couple years ago. It said that, you know, minimum wage earners, middle class earners, they spend almost 100 percent of every dime they make. It goes right back in the economy. You take the top 5 percent of the country, they only reinvest or spend you know, anywhere between five and ten percent. That's not that's not economic growth. That's you know, they're spending a, a very small amount. Yeah, it might add up to more than what others are spending. But if you give middle income earners more money, they're going to spend it. That's going to help the economy. Shipping this money over to Switzerland to the Cayman Islands that does nothing for us, does it? No, absolutely not. In fact, it basically is taking that money out of the economy, putting it over there, hiding the money, hiding the names. Uh, but, you know, this has been going on forever. Uh, and, and we really need to make sure that, that we stop it now. Uh, one, of, one of the things that gets me, uh, we've only got about a minute left, but the Republicans, when they, when they you know, say, OK, you want to extend unemployment benefits. Well, where are we going to cut that money from? Where is the offset? Are they proposing any kind of offset for this corporate money that's you know coming out of the economy, three hundred billion a year? I propose that we extend the benefits by getting these people, these tax cheats, that three hundred billion, to pay the money, and then we can use that money to help the ninety-nine percent to make sure that people can have a, a, a standard of living that they can live on, raise the minimum wage, and give benefits to those people who need it, like the unemployment benefits or the food stamps for the people who really need those things. Take it from the people who are cheating the government; they're not even entitled to that money. They should give it back and let us use that for those purposes. Absolutely. And and I think it's important to note, too, that the average unemployment payment is roughly the same as the federal minimum wage. So the, the thought that these people are out there making a ton of money from doing nothing is completely bogus. But uh, Michael Berg, we're out of time. Thank you so much for being with us this week. Thank you, Farron. And that's it for this week's Ring of Fire, but you can keep up with us online throughout the week at ringoffireradio.com or on Twitter at Ring of Fire Radio and on Facebook. For Mike Papantonio, I'm Farron Cousins, and we'll see you next week right here on Ring of Fire.